Solar Eclipse, Part 2 of 2 From Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia http colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org Section 4. Observing a Solar Eclipse Looking directly at the photosphere of the sun, the bright disk of the sun itself, even for just a few seconds, can cause permanent damage to the retina of the eye because of the intense visible and invisible radiation that the photosphere emits. This damage can result in permanent impairment of vision, up to and including blindness. The retina has no sensitivity to pain, and the effects of retinal damage may not appear for hours, so there is no warning that injury is occurring. Under normal conditions, the sun is so bright that it's difficult to stare at it directly, so there is no tendency to look at it in a way that might damage the eye. However, during an eclipse with so much of the sun covered, it is easier and more tempting to stare at it. Unfortunately, looking at the sun during an eclipse is just as dangerous as looking at it outside an eclipse, except during the brief period of totality when the sun's disk is completely covered. Totality occurs only during a total eclipse and only very briefly. It does not occur during a partial or annular eclipse. Viewing the sun's disk through any kind of optical aid, binoculars, a telescope, or even an optical camera viewfinder is even more hazardous. Glancing at the sun with all or most of its disk visible is unlikely to result in permanent harm, as the pupil will close down and reduce the brightness of the whole scene. If the eclipse is near total, the low average amount of light causes the pupil to open. Unfortunately, the remaining parts of the sun are still just as bright, so are now brighter on the retina than when looking at a full sun. As the eye has a small sweet spot, or fovea, for detailed viewing, the tendency will be to track the image on this best part of the retina, causing damage. Viewing Partial and Annular Eclipses Viewing the sun during partial and annular eclipses, and during total eclipses outside the brief period of totality, requires special eye protection or indirect viewing methods. The sun's disk can be viewed using appropriate filtration to block the harmful part of the sun's radiation. Sunglasses are not safe since they do not block the harmful and invisible infrared radiation which causes retinal damage. Only properly designed and certified solar filters should ever be used for direct viewing of the sun's disk. The safest way to view the sun's disk is by indirect projection. This can be done by projecting an image of the disc onto a white piece of paper or card using a pair of binoculars with one of the lenses covered, a telescope, or another piece of cardboard with a small hole in it about one millimeter diameter, often called a pinhole camera. The projected image of the sun can then be safely viewed. This technique can be used to observe sunspots as well as eclipses. However, care must be taken to ensure that no one looks through the projector telescope, pinhole, etc., directly. Viewing the sun's disk on a video display screen provided by a video camera or digital camera is safe, although the camera itself may be damaged by direct exposure to the sun. The optical viewfinders provided with some video and digital cameras are not safe. Viewing totality during total eclipses. Contrary to popular belief, it is safe to observe the total phase of a solar eclipse directly with the unaided eye binoculars, or a telescope when the sun's photosphere is completely covered by the moon. Indeed, this is a very spectacular and beautiful sight, and it is too dim to be seen through filters. The sun's faint corona will be visible, and even the chromosphere, solar prominences, and possibly even a solar flare may be seen. However, it is important to stop directly viewing the sun promptly at the end of the totality. The exact time and duration of totality for the location from which the eclipse is being observed should be determined from a reliable source. Also very beautiful are the effects just before and just after totality. When the shrinking visible part of the photosphere becomes very small, Bailey beads will occur. These are caused by the sunlight still being able to reach Earth through lunar valleys, but no longer where mountains are present. Totality then begins with the diamond ring effect, the last bright flash of sunlight. Note that it is not entirely safe to view Bailey beads or the diamond ring without proper eye protection, because in both cases the photosphere is still visible. Section 5. Other Observations 
For astronomers, a total solar eclipse forms a rare opportunity to observe the corona, the outer layer of the sun's atmosphere. Normally, this is not visible because the photosphere is much brighter than the corona. According to the point reached in the solar cycle, the corona can appear rather small and symmetric, or large and fuzzy. It is very hard to predict this prior to totality. During a solar eclipse, special indirect observations can also be done with the unaided eye only. Normally, the spots of light which fall through the small openings between the leaves of a tree have a circular shape. These are images of the sun. During a partial eclipse, the light spots will show the partial shape of the sun. Another famous observation is the so-called flying shadows, which are similar to those on the bottom of the swimming pool. They occur just prior to and after totality and are very difficult to observe. Many professional eclipse chasers have never seen them. Special Observation Campaigns in 1919, the observation of a total solar eclipse helped to confirm Einstein's theory of general relativity. By comparing the apparent distance between two stars, with and without the sun in between them, the predictions about gravitational lenses were confirmed. Of course, the observation with the sun in between was only possible during totality, since the stars are visible then. Over the years, some less important special observations took place. May 30, 1965, launch of rockets at Charlestown, USA. May 20, 1966, launch of rockets at Karistos, Greece to watch the solar eclipse. November 12, 1966, launch of two Titus rockets from Las Palmas, Argentina. February 26, 1979, launch of rockets from Red Lake, Canada. February 16, 1980, Launch of rockets from San Marco platform. Solar eclipse before sunrise or after sunset. The phenomenon of atmospheric diffraction makes it possible to observe the sun, and hence a solar eclipse, even when it is slightly below the horizon. It is, however, possible for a solar eclipse to attain totality, or in the event of a partial eclipse near totality, before visual or actual sunrise, or after sunset from a particular location. When this occurs shortly before the former or after the latter, the sky will appear much darker than it would otherwise be immediately before sunrise or after sunset. On these occasions, an object, especially a planet, often Mercury, may be visible near the sunrise or sunset point of the horizon when it could not have been seen without the eclipse. Simultaneous Occurrence of Eclipses and Transits in principle, the simultaneous occurrence of a solar eclipse and a transit of a planet is possible, but these events are extremely rare because of their short durations. The next anticipated simultaneous occurrence of a solar eclipse and a transit of Mercury will be on July 5, 6757, and of a solar eclipse and a transit of Venus is expected on April 5, 15,232. Only five hours after the transit of Venus on June 4, 1769, there was a total solar eclipse, which was visible in North America, Europe, and Northern Asia as a partial solar eclipse. This was the lowest time difference between a transit of a planet and a solar eclipse in the historical past. More common, but still quite rare, is a conjunction of any planet, not confined exclusively to Mercury or Venus, at the time a total solar eclipse, in which event the planet will be visible very near the eclipsed sun, when without the eclipse it would have been lost in the sun's glare. At one time, some scientists hypothesized that there may be a planet, often given the name Vulcan, even closer to the sun than Mercury. The only way to confirm its existence would have been to observe it during a total solar eclipse. However, it is now known that no such planet exists, although there remains some possibility for small vulcanoid asteroids to exist, although none have ever been found. Solar eclipses by and from artificial satellites. Artificial satellites can also get in the line between Earth and Sun, but none are large enough to cause an eclipse. At the altitude of the International Space Station, for example, an object would need to be about 3.35 kilometers across to blot the Sun out entirely. 
This means the best you can get is a satellite transit, but these events are difficult to watch because the zone of visibility is very small. The satellite passes over the face of the sun in about a second, typically. Like a transit of a planet, it will not get dark. Artificial satellites do play an important role in documenting solar eclipses. Images of the umbra on the Earth's surface taken from Mir and the International Space Station are among the most spectacular eclipse images in history. The direct observation of a total solar eclipse from space is rather rare. The only documented case is Gemini 12. The partial phase of the 2006 total eclipse was visible from the International Space Station. At first, it looked as though an orbit correction in the middle of March would bring the ISS in the path of totality, but this correction was postponed. Section 6. See also. See also eclipses on other planets. Solar eclipses on Jupiter. Solar eclipses on Pluto. Transit of Phobos from Mars. Transit of Deimos from Mars. Eclipse lists. List of solar eclipses dedicated solar eclipse articles, list of solar eclipses seen from China, list of solar eclipses visible from the United Kingdom 1000 AD to 2006 AD. Miscellaneous, a lay effect, solar eclipses in fiction. This concludes part two of solar eclipses. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html.